Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Service Mesh is probably the fastest growing cloud management company that you've never heard of. Okay. Uh, I wanted to spend a slide and just tell you a little bit about us. I am, generally speaking, not going to uh, give direct product plugs in this. Uh, there is one slide at the end where I will do a cheap, shameless, tawdry plug of my product. And I hope that you will stay around all the way through the presentation for that. Um, Service Mesh focuses on large global 2000 Fortune 500 customers. We're involved in some of the biggest of the big customers in uh, areas like financial services, pharma, consumer products. And we uh, are uh, worldwide. We do business here in North America. We hang out a lot on Wall Street. We spend time in Europe and London in uh, Asia Pac as well, and financial centers and places where those big companies live and do business. We were named the fastest growing cloud company in 2010. I don't know if that's true or not, but we did grow really, really fast, and we beat out a lot of other companies that submitted for the same award that we did, over 300 or something like that, 350 different companies submitted for that. Uh, we're profitable, we are a fairly mid-sized startup, is I guess what I say, or, or maybe a middle-aged startup. All right, I want you guys to think back to some of the old movies and cartoons you've seen. And when somebody gets put in prison, they invariably end up with a big ball and chain attached to their leg and a big sledgehammer in their hand and they start cracking rocks. You know why they do that? Turns out that forcing somebody to do useless work that means nothing is mental torture. And it is a way to actually punish inmates. Okay? And what I want to ask today is, are we, as an industry, as professionals, in danger of doing the same thing to ourselves? If you ever worked on a project that you knew was bound to fail, was not going to go anywhere, was not valued by your corporation, and didn't mean anything, you know that feeling that you get in the gut, in the pit of your stomach, when you feel like you're doing meaningless stuff. And so I want to ask the question, everybody's told you a lot about what, 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 what do you do, what do you do, what do you do? I want to ask the question, why? Why do we want to do it? All right, let's look back at a decade of IT evolution, just really briefly, just so we can all be on the same page. Um, if you think about, in the old days, we used to provision infrastructure this way. This is when this really um, was really torturous. Some of you guys are still living in this age, so I apologize, you need to get Fast forward 10 years um, all the way up. Uh, a developer puts in a request to the IT department. The IT department goes through some sort of approval process with a manager of some sort. The manager says, OK. They issue a purchase order. A shipment comes back. They spend a lot of time doing installation and configuration. And finally, 12 to 16 weeks later, IT says, your infrastructure, sir, is ready. And they hand you a big check or a big uh, bill, rather, with that, and you pay them a lot of money to do that. And that's, and that's the way that infrastructure provisioning worked. Five years ago, we started to change that flow a little bit, right? We started to introduce virtualization into the mix. So the developer talks to an IT department, but now the IT department has some sort of provisioning tool, right? VMware circa 2005, okay? And the developer sends in a request, gets back an approval, and we create a VM and we're done. And that still takes about a week, right? There's been a lot of talk uh, around here uh, over the past couple days about automation. And so three years ago, we started to do this in the cloud. It wasn't just in VMware running in our own data center on our own infrastructure, but it was somewhere out there. And so now we replace the VM provisioning tool with a cloud provisioning tool. And we send in a request, and we get an OK. And we get an approval. And we created an instance, and we hand back a ready. And the total time is still about a week. OK, let's talk about a year ago. Finally, people started getting smart. They said, well, this is really dumb. The thing that's really slowing us down is the lack of automation. You've heard people talk about automation, automation, automation. OK, so now we have a self-service portal that we throw into the mix. And what we allow is for the developers to send a request in to the IT department. We create an instance, and we hand back an instance to the developer. And that takes about an hour with an asterisk. As long as it's Monday through Friday, 
8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. where the guy who sits at the desk who receives the request is working. And you know how many developers love to work Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5, okay? Honest to God, I used to work with a guy who we thought was Dracula, right? We'd be going out in the evening and he'd be coming in and he was the only one that worked and he'd work all night and we'd be coming in in the morning and he'd be going out. And he was pasty white, graduated from MIT, he was the most wicked smart guy that you could ever imagine, but he was literally Dracula. All right, so now, what do we do today? So we'll hear a lot of talk at the conference, automation, 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 gotta automate, automate now. All right, so now what happens is we hook up a self-service portal with an orchestration engine. And the orchestration engine is able to drive the infrastructure automatically. And so what typically happens is IT creates service offerings that live in that self-service portal. You can choose from this menu of stuff that IT has defined for you. And you send in your request, and it creates the instance, and it just happens really, really fast, like five minutes fast. And that's a wonderful thing. That is good, and we should all clap our hands and say, yes, we did it, okay? Because we've been working on that for 10 years <laughs> to get that to happen in a way that was actually repeatable and, and reasonable. Okay, along with that, we've started talking about cloud, and the conventional thinking around cloud is you gotta do it because, number one, say it with me, it's cheaper, and number two, it's more agile faster, right? Those are all good things, and they are good things. I don't want to actually, at the end of the day, belittle those things. Those are good things, and they are true. I'm here to tell you they are true. I will not be a total contrarian. I'm just going to tell you that all this is small ball. At the end of the day, it is minor league, junior varsity, doesn't matter stuff. We are solving IT problems with IT solutions. And if we want to have a real impact, we're going to have to shift our focus from solving IT problems to solving business problems. I don't know about you guys, I'm an engineer. I graduated with a degree in computer engineering. I have 11 patents, I've written three books. I'm a techie, okay? This is not a technical problem. Cloud is not a technical problem. There are many, many good technologies out there. Cloud is a people and a business problem. And as an industry, I think we need to start thinking that way in order to have an impact. Okay, let's talk about technology and how it gets adopted. If you're to look back and think about major waves of technology adoption, they tend to go in kind of big spurts. And I've drawn this as this kind of wavy line. So what you have is you have periods of incremental improvement where technology really doesn't do a lot that are then punctuated by really intense value creation in a short span of time, okay? And typically what's going on during the incremental improvement phase is that technologies are being worked on and they get to the point where everything starts to fit and a new capability is created that wasn't there before. And then during the intense value creation phase, that technology gets exploited, that new capability gets exploited to deliver end user value creation. And the typical span between those big waves is something like 10 to 15 years, give or take. If you think about what's happened in the past, we've seen this a few times. Personal computing in the 1980s was a big wave, right? Where we suddenly moved away from having everything in the glass house to democratizing computation and putting it in the hands of business people. I still remember people you buying Apple IIs on their own dime with VisiCalc so that they could run spreadsheets, or an IBM PC with Lotus 123 way back when to perform accounting, right? And those were the superstars in your larger, um, your larger uh, organizations. Um, the web came along, and we saw you know, a huge amount of, um, obviously, value creation that happened in that wave. I think that um, the cloud is of the same ilk. Okay, if you look at those phases where there's intense value creation, fortunes are won or lost during those times. Okay, and it's not just the fortunes of vendors selling to you guys, it's your fortunes. In the flatter phases, what ends up happening is the folks that win tend to try to buttress the status quo. 
They try to not let the game change again. Right? They were the winners in the last round. Congratulations to them. They hang on to it for dear life, and they try to ensure that things don't move. And for the most part, they don't until the next wave comes. And so you saw you know, companies, I mean, think about IT examples, um, how Microsoft, who won in the personal computing phase, was really challenged in the web phase and almost lost it. Okay? Um, they were able to hold on and, and kind of recover. They're now getting challenged in the cloud phase. right? And you see that time and time again with, uh, I think, every, every industry. So the big lesson here is that big value creation, big, big, key on big, happens during rapid technology adoption. New technologies come online, and they get exploited by the first movers to take business advantage of them. And so what I mean by value capture is market share, revenue, and profitability, business metrics. And again, I want to hammer this home. This is your market share, your revenue, and your profitability, not your vendors. Okay? Think about your business and what you get paid for. Think about the web. The winners in the web were the guys that said, let's use the web to change the way that we engage with our customers and transact business. Right? We're going to change the way we do things. This is really substantial and new, and we need to take advantage of it. The losers were the guys that said, let's buy a server. Throw up a web page. It'll be cool. We can all run Mozilla on our desktops, and it'll be neat. And we can look at the old Yahoo page that was gray with the site of the day on it. And remember way back when. Right? Those are the guys that really didn't get it. They thought it was a toy, and it was kind of an extension of what they were doing inside with LANs and things like that, but they really didn't seize on it. So let's talk about examples. Amazon, seize the day. I mean, honestly, I'm going to be the biggest bookstore on Earth, and then I'm going to be the biggest DVD store on Earth, and then I'm going to be the biggest store on Earth, right? I'm going to sell you everything, and I'm going to do it all over the web. Right? I mean, really make it really fast and really easy. I'm going to exploit this to the max. And now you actually find Amazon, ironically enough, being one of the leaders in the cloud space. OK, Amazon's competition. Borders declared bankruptcy earlier this year. <laughs> Let's put up a web page, see if it works, right? So winners and losers, guys that saw the future and were able to exploit the technology and not just see it as a continuation of all the old processes and things that they had done, but really saw ways to change the business metrics. OK, agile IT and cloud computing. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to say that these are at least as transformational to enterprises, to Fortune 500, Global 2000, and your business, even if it's mid-sized, as the web was. This is one of the biggest changes. Over the last decades, ever since the 50s and 60s, IT has been rushing into corporations, almost, almost like a wave when you're standing at the beach. Right? And the big wave crests and the water runs between your toes. And then what we're seeing with cloud is the water's running back out. It's coming outside the corporation. Right? It doesn't mean that corporations aren't going to do IT, but it means that they're going to do it in a largely different way. But most of us, again, I think are playing small ball. Part of the problem is that we have a really narrow view on who we're addressing. And I said this a little bit before, but I think a lot of IT solutions get sold to solve IT problems, not business problems. A lot of the time, if you think about those, uh, the last sequence of, of slides earlier, where I showed kind of the progression of automation, a lot of that, again, had the IT department in the middle of it. Right? It was an IT-focused message. It was an IT-focused solution. And I think that we need to pan out a little bit, pull back, and really examine that again. Um, we're largely going for things like, when we talk about cost for, for cloud, for instance, we're going to do cloud because it's cheaper than the IT we were doing before. Again, we're solving an IT cost problem with an IT solution. But we're trying to do, fundamentally, machine and operations arbitrage. right? We're betting that 
my buying a server and hiring a couple guys to run it is going to be more expensive than Amazon buying a bunch of servers and hiring a fewer set of guys to go run it, right? And that's really what we're, that's the cost trade-off there. When we say that cloud is cheaper, one of the things that we're talking about is just, you know, who can run it, run things better. And that may be true. Amazon might be able to run a cloud cheaper than you if you're a small company with really high overhead costs or you're just really screwed up at your IT business, right? If you're just really pathetically horrible, okay? Now, I'm not, that's, that's, that's nothing against Amazon, but when you get to the scale, the companies that we deal with, Fortune 500, Global 2000, they're at scale. They can do things pretty effectively when they want to, okay? When they can get out of their own way. Now, that's, that's another issue, but um, suffice it to say that it's a thin value proposition, and you can argue all day long about whether cloud's cheaper or whether it's not, the fact is, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's not 99% cheaper. It's not 80% cheaper. It's maybe 20% cheaper. Okay, it's the kind of thing that you probably could have gone into vendor negotiations with your sourcing people and beaten up your server guys to get a few more points off, okay? The other fallacy that I think that we run into is this idea that automation, and in particular IT operations automation, equals business agility. There's an indirect relationship there, clearly, right? So I, far be it for me to argue against operations automation. It's a good thing. But I think too often we assume that because IT has automated something, that the rest of the organization cares. Okay, I heard a lot of talk this morning um, about VLANs and VMs and, you know, firewall rules and all the rest of it. Does your organization really care about that? Does that move the needle for you? Think about that. If you walked into your business unit and talked to your product manager for one of your company's products and you said, I just bought the neatest automation tool, it automates VLAN creation. He, he would look at you and go, get out of my office, right? I, I, there, there isn't, why am I talking to you, right? You're not doing anything for me. Go back to your hole, right? All right, I think the, yeah, exactly. Okay, so the solution for this is to focus on the whole solution delivery lifecycle. And I talk about solution, and I know that there's, there's something called the software uh, delivery lifecycle, and I'm making a very distinct difference to that, the solution delivery lifecycle, because sometimes it's about software, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's about, uh, it's, it's not the, the, the writing or the creation of software, but it's the, cre it's the delivery of a business solution to an end customer, okay, that is IT-based. It will have an IT component clearly in it, but it is not necessarily the act of creating software. And I think we have to focus very strongly on that. There's a whole lot of guys that stand between the IT department and the end customer, and they need to be fed capabilities that allow them to make decisions and to deliver capabilities that impact customers. Okay, and when we can do that, when we can optimize that overall solution delivery lifecycle, I think that we will have had an impact. So doing things like lowering the cost, effort, and hassle of delivering solutions ends up resulting in product guys running more experiments. It's very hard to plan business and get it right every single time. And so as a result of that, people have this idea of fast fail, right? That if you don't know what to do, the best you can do is really take your best guess and see what happens. And if the cost of failure is really high, you tend to be disincented to do that. The gain has to be commensurately high in order for that to pay off, because you might be wrong. You might get fired, all those things, right? If you can get, if you can lower that bar down, 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 where the cost of running an experiment is really cheap, you can do it all the time. And you don't worry about getting fired. It's just the normal course of business that some things are going to pay off, and they're going to pay off big, and other things are not, right? But the cost of doing them is not high, so you didn't lose anything by running the experiment. So if we can focus on delivering capabilities to that solution delivery lifecycle, we can fast fail and we can find things that deliver value to our customers. So the big test, and I want you to think about this one a lot. Did you alter your company's earnings per share today? For the better. Okay. 
I know some of you guys were thinking, I got this one. <laughs> All right, no, it's got to go up. Oh, okay. All right. Problem two, um, generic offerings and limited synergy. We talked about some of the, the systems that we're putting in place, and these are all great, but again, they end up tending to have the IT department in the middle, right? The IT department is the creator of things, and then we have people in business units that consume them, right? How many, uh, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands. A lot of you guys work in shops where that is the normal course of business, and a lot of you guys are feeling the pressure now because businesses, uh, business unit guys have the capability to go jam credit cards into web screens and run around you. Right? And that's the result of the fact that sometimes IT thinks it's the center of the universe and will tell you what we're going to deliver to you and then you can choose from our menu. It's like going into a restaurant where there's like three items. Right? And people are saying, I'm not, I'm not going to eat there. So IT is, I think, suffers a lot from Henry Ford's great quote. Right? You can have any color you want as long as it's black. I'll decide what to give you and you can choose from my limited set and that's it. So, as a result, business units are tempted to bypass IT to go around you, cut you out of the loop. The solution is to flip this on its head and embrace collaboration. There are a ton of really good IT solutions that are actually living in your business units. In your developers' heads, they, they know a lot about IT too, those developer type guys, right? Not just operations guys. And they're able to teach you a thing or two. And they're able to actually share that potentially with their peers in other business units and develop synergy. Now, how do you do that? Well, you got to put a platform in the middle that allows you to do that, where people can you know, put things into a, a repository. They can search that repository. They can find things. And then people can pull stuff out. Now, the IT department is a part of that. IT does develop good solutions. And there are some, some reasonable things out there. They're just not the only things. And so we have to, I think, open our, our blinders a little bit and focus on some of the longer term value that we can extract from people in business units. Okay, problem three. Um, enterprise IT is really diverse. If you say that I'm gonna live in a world where I'm gonna allow business unit folks to have access to tools and make decisions and create solutions that are then shared with other people, and I'm in a world where I have a whole bunch of other big hairball uh, legacy systems that I have to integrate with, and I'm in a world that says there is no the cloud, there are only 27 different clouds that I've subscribed to that all have a different set of characteristics, performance, cost, latency, security, and others, um, that I am going to have a, a pretty wild and crazy environment. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to lose control. And so that's the question is, how do you um, in a world particularly where you're ruled by auditors or governance people, regulators, some of the, the guys that we work with in the financial industry, there are regulators that are looking very strenuously at cloud and asking really hard questions about what they can guarantee and what they can't. And how do you provide maximal choice for people, maximal capability, while at the same time maintaining a certain amount of control? Things like role-based access control, I heard that. Policy is going to be the next cloud buzzword, by the way. That's, uh, that's my tip for you. Um, in the next, in, in Santa Clara, uh, Jeremy, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about policy and how wonderful that is, and everybody's going to be policy, 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 policy. Okay, policy is not role-based access control. This is not the case where, you know, the HR department in London is only allowed to use clouds in London. Okay, or the guys in America that are developers can only deploy things in America. Those are important restrictions, but they draw the net way too tight. Okay? What we end up having is a really complex cross product of users, workloads, data sets, geographies, laws, all of which have to be embedded into the policy management system in order for things to work right, for the governance to work. Right? But that has to be pretty granular. It could be Dave, sitting in London, can't run a production workload that deals with sensitive customer data in the United States. Okay? But Dave can run non-production workloads that don't deal, that have stubbed out data sets that are bogus data sets in the United States and take advantage of cheap clouds here or there or wherever. Right? This is really important to get right because the stakes really are high. Um, we talked about laws, we talked about regulators and people like that. 
Um, this is a real case. I actually found this on the internet. A couple guys from uh, Google, execs from Google, got convicted in Italy of violating Italy's privacy laws. And evidently, they are going to spend six months in jail for that. I thought that was shocking. I mean, I, I figured they'd get off with a slap on the hand, you know, have to pay a fine, all that sort of stuff. No, yeah, it, I mean, it's like cuff them, book them, Dano, you know, over the hood of the car, right? So um, it's, a, it's a real issue. And if we don't solve it, I think, you know, cloud, we, we talk a lot about security in terms of data not being compromised, but I don't, but I think we sometimes, you know, walk away with a warm fuzzy because we've wrapped it in encryption and stuff like that, we're good to go. And you can break other laws, even if your data is all encrypted, even if nobody broke in, just the mere fact that you deployed something in the wrong spot can be a crime. Okay, so the solution here is advanced policy management, right? I think that this is a role for IT, by the way, is to help work with security folks, audit folks, regulators, governance teams and boards to craft the set of policies and update the set of policies to conform to new laws that come down the pikes that everybody else gets to play within, okay? And the goal here is to ensure that the right outcomes happen at scale across the enterprise. Okay, so your challenge, three things. I could have gone on, I'd probably give you a list of 10, but I only got 30 minutes, so I gotta, I gotta wrap it up. Uh, one, focus on the solution delivery lifecycle. Don't get narrow-minded. This is not an IT technical problem. This is a larger business problem. And if you pull back and you continually ask yourselves and work with your business units to find out what would make their lives better, not just IT operations lives easier, I think that you'll hit on a whole host of things where IT can be really relevant. We spend a lot of time with Service Mesh working with CIOs to come up with cloud strategies. And the first question we ask them is, what's your business strategy? Are you going to grow by acquisition? Are you going to go into emerging markets? Are you uh, going to try to steal share with a new product release? Are you going to try to engage your customers? What, what's your business strategy? If you don't know that, and that's not being pushed all the way down to your level, ask. Because it really matters. Because if you can support that, I'll tell you, it's a lot easier going in front of the folks that give you money to do IT projects if you can say, I think that we can make this company more profitable as a result of that. Right? That's a much more powerful argument than you know, it was the next logical step on the IT automation treadmill. Right? Two, embrace collaboration. Again, there are a lot of folks in your companies that know how to do IT, that are not IT guys, that know how to come up with solutions, that are very happy doing it themselves, handing it to you, and letting you share it with all the rest of the folks out there. And so harness their energy. One of the reasons why the internet is so interesting, why open source is so interesting, is the collaboration aspect of it. You can make a really small contribution, and a really small contribution, and if everybody just makes a really small contribution, it finally stacks up to something really meaningful at the end of the day. Right? How can you apply those same principles inside and use the cloud to go do it? Finally, how do you empower all users with advanced policy management? Right? Let people go wild as long as they're not breaking laws or compromising your data. Right? Don't draw the net so tight and be so restrictive that you choke off the innovation and the collaboration that you'd like to enable in the first two. Okay, here's the big finish. Cue the blatant product plug. All right, we are a software company. We make a software package that will help do some of these things. What we've tried to do is look at the full cloud lifecycle for workloads, all the way from planning of applications all the way into production and runtime. We can do things like deployment. We can automate up the wazoo. We've got a, uh, a uh, user portal where you can go in and select workloads that you want to run. Uh, it works across. SaaS, PaaS, and infrastructure as a service, and I think that's really important because I'll tell you another topic for Santa Clara in six months might be the fact that nobody really gives a rip about infrastructure as a service anymore. Once you, the funny thing about handing somebody a virtual machine is after you do it enough times, they go, why do I want a virtual machine? I don't really want a virtual machine. I don't really want to deal with Windows or Linux or backups or disks or any of that stuff. 
Why don't you just hand me a pass environment that I can deploy my code into? Okay. Um, we handle things like identity federation across the cloud so that every instance running in a hybrid of clouds, internal, external, public, private, um, can be logged into with a single sign-on. Okay, so that people don't have to deal with manual password management, even automated manual password management, right, uh, to go get done what they have to get done. We are going to be showing a demo of Agility Platform tomorrow morning. It's like at 11.30, 11.30, 11. And uh, my associate, Anthony Skipper, will be here tomorrow to talk about some case studies and some of the things that we've learned in working with some of the leading companies that are doing uh, cloud deployments right now. Uh, he's got a session called Battle Scars tomorrow, or Cloud Scars, that happens at 2.30 tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dave Roberts.